Howdy everyone, I'm Michael Perch. I'm an associate professor at the University of Texas at Austin and I record all of my lectures and I put them online to support my students during the course and even after the course as they move on through their courses and career and also to support all of the working professionals interested to address the digital challenge and anyone interested in science and engineering. Let's get started. What we're going to do today is we're going to do a walkthrough of a workflow in Python for the purpose of being able to calculate varigrams. Now this is part of spatial data analytics and a varigram is an excellent measure of spatial continuity or a measure of the degree of dissimilarity over distance. Now I have lectures where I get into all of these details and you can go ahead and check those lectures out if you'd like. You can see them in previous videos in this playlist. But for now, let's go ahead and go through this workflow in Python using Geostats Pi, my package for spatial data analytics for being able to calculate directional varigrams. Every time I have a workflow like this, I like to provide some details from the lecture notes, spatial continuity, a little bit of a definition, the semi-varigram, pay attention to the equation right here. Of course, we're gonna be calculating the one half the average, one half the average, square difference between spatial data separated by a lag vector h. So we're going to look for pairs in our data set separated by that h vector and we can take one half the average of that squared and that will give us the semi varigram Now I will probably say varigram throughout this discussion. In this class we don't tend to differentiate. Everyone when they talk about a varigram are talking about the semi varigram the one half calculation and we do that specifically so this math works out that is the covariance function which is a measure of similarity over distance is just the sill or the variance of the problem minus the varigram okay so i also make some varigram observations now those are all available in the lecture notes I'll leave you to go back to the lecture. I don't want to inflate the length of this video covering all of that. We will simply get into the concept of detecting directions of continuity. Now, why do we want to do this? Because when we model the varigram, we're going to model with a geometric anisotropy model. And if you're wondering what the geometric anisotropy model looks like, this is it right here. Not a big deal at all because all we've done in two dimensions is we've modeled spatial continuity as an ellipse where we have a direction we call the major direction of spatial continuity where we have a range which will be the major the larger range and then orthogonal to it we will have a minor direction of continuity which will have a smaller range and then everything in between we can infer the varigram or spatial continuity in between the major and the minor by just relying on a geometric anisotropy model which is shaped like an ellipse it's an interpolation between angles that will transition from the major to the minor with an ellipse shape or contour now i'll show you right away here varigram maps will actually visualize this geometric anisotropy experimentally with a real data set so that'll be pretty helpful okay so we're gonna have to detect the major and the minor direction of continuity in order to build a reliable varigram model we're gonna then model the ranges in the major and the minor and that will give us a structure that we can put together um, with nested multiple structures describing different components of the variances each one of them defined by their major and minor so now we've got our mission if we choose to accept it is to try to find the major and the minor direction okay so let's see how we can do that i'm going to go ahead and reset the kernel as i always like to do this clear all the outputs okay so let's get started so first thing we've got to do is we've got to grab geostat pi and so we'll run that block of code now we have access to my package to be able to conduct spatial data analytics in python which is great we want to do that in python okay so let's load up um, a variety of different packages os so we can interact with the operating system not a big deal numpy so we can work with arrays or matrices and all of the associated math pandas for data frames for the data that we're going to work with 
and matplotlib for basic plotting, plotting barograms and maps and things. Okay, let's set a working directory. Now, the first thing you're gonna have to do is we work with a data set called sample data biased. It's gonna be biased, I'm pretty sure. At least it's honest about that. Okay, so that data is available to you. Here's a link to it. And here's the actual address on my GitHub. I have a repository, which is GeoData. Um, that has a whole bunch of different data sets available, synthetic data sets to try things out, and I use them in my workflow. You're gonna have to put that in a directory on your drive or cloud or wherever you work, and then set that right there. And that way, when we so I'll go ahead and run that code. Ah, what did I do wrong? I always do this. I get so excited I forget to run a block. Remember, in Jupyter Notebook, if you don't run a block, it didn't happen. And so when we re reset the kernel and everything, all of these imports, everything disappeared. Or when you freshly load the code, nothing's run. So you got to run that. That now imported OS. So when I run this command, it'll work now. You see that? I make that mistake all the time. I get too excited talking. Let's go ahead and load in the data set that we've already downloaded and saved into this directory. And we'll, when we load it, pd is pandas and dot read underscore csv is a built-in function to pandas that allows you to read a comma delimited file directly to a data frame. And df head is a function to be able to do a preview of the first, uh, what is it? The first five entries or samples. And remember Python is zero index. So it goes from zero to four, the first five samples in the data frame. So if we wanted to, we could do our calculation by faces. And in my previous workflow I do, to do that you'd use code like this, where you're extracting sand, which is faces one, or shale, which is faces zero, into separate data frames in order to get the job done. Okay, so let's go ahead. We're just going to do it all faces at once because we're going to do a lot of iterations. I don't want to spend time doing that for each sand and shale. You could do that, of course, on your own. Let's look at the summary statistics. Always a good idea. If we're doing spatial data analytics, you first do univariate data analytics, even multivariate. You try to see the structures in the data. And we have porosity going from about 5% porosity all the way up to about 20 to 23% porosity. Okay, interesting. We also have permeability data we can work with too. Okay, so let's go ahead and we'll do a Gaussian transform to transform the distribution to standard normal. Standard normal means a mean of zero, a variance of one, the Gaussian shape. Okay, so everything's gonna be going on between about negative three to positive three on the other side. Now, I like the GS, GS Live approach to Gaussian transform. And so we'll use that. And I coded that up as n score within my package. And we can, of course, see the parameters right here by just typing the name. And of course, if you want to get to the doc strings, just put the parentheses in and type a shift tab and you'll see the doc strings. You can expand that out and you'll see exactly what are the parameters required for it. Okay, so not a big deal, super easy, the data frame, the variable column waiting if you did the clustering and we can also use a reference distribution to aid the transformation we're just going to use it data driven create the transformation table directly from the data not using some reference data to support okay so we can go ahead and run this command the output from it is going to be a gaussian transform variable that will automatically sign as a brand new feature in our data frame called npor and nperm. Now, what's really cool is we also get the transformation output. And that's pretty useful. It's telling you the original porosity values and their transform values so you can actually plot the QQ plot if you like. And so if you want to do that, take a look at the QQ plot. Not a bad idea. See the similarity between the distribution and where you transformed it to, i.e. the standard Gaussian distribution. Okay, let's, we ran that. I hope we ran it. I can't remember if we ran it. I'm having too much fun. Let's go ahead and I ran it now, do a preview. And yep, we got normal score, transform porosity, permeability. The values look pretty good. We could do a describe and look at summary statistics and so forth and confirm. I'll leave that to you on in your own time to take a look at that. Let's just check the histograms though. That's a good idea. I love looking at CDFs. CDFs, you avoid all that binning issue. It's at the resolution of the data. And look at porosity going in. Hmm, interesting. Looks a little bit like it could be um, bimodal for sure, right? 
you see this kind of higher density here, leveling off, not so many samples, high density again. We've got, if you looked at the PDF, we got a little bit of that going on for sure. Okay, so now when, after we do the Gaussian transform, the normal score transform, look at that. Wow, you know, as we say in Canada, you know, just ooh la la, you know, that is a beautiful looking Gaussian distribution. That's fantastic. Um, and so that's exactly what we expect, that really nice characteristic CDF with the skewed S shape. And then if we look at the original permeability, I, whenever I show a CDF like this to my students, I always like to ask, what's the shape of that PDF? And um, just give it some thought. Clearly a positive skewed, if not even a log normal distribution. And then after we do the Gaussian transformation, we're in Gaussian space. Now, I haven't really spent the time explaining this video, but we'll want to do the Gaussian transformation because these barograms are going to be used in sequential Gaussian simulation, but that's a couple weeks away from now, a week or so when we get into simulation methodologies. Okay, so what's the methodology to detect directionality in a spatial feature? Now, I always tell my students, the place we always start with all of our data analytics is ocular inspection. Good plotting and looking at the plots is not a bad idea. Ocular inspection, why do I say it like that? It sounds much better than saying just take a look at it. But that's what we're going to do. So let's just take a look at it and see what it looks like. And here's the data. Now this is very interesting. What do we see here? The first thing we're going to observe, if you look really careful, blur your eyes a little bit, squint, kind of look at it, let it sink in. I hope you can see that there's a direction that goes like this. There is clearly some type of major direction continuity here, here, and this would be a shorter range of continuity than minor in that direction. So my ocular inspection is telling me that I suspect 0, 4, 5 to be the major and azimuth 1, 3, 5, 90 degrees from it to be the minor. Now, I also like to plot the permeability versus porosity, normal score transformed. Why am I doing that? Because if I'm going to model permeability and porosity, and they're highly correlated with each other, it means that they should share spatial structures. They should look very similar to each other as far as the barogram. And so we can confirm that, yeah, they look pretty correlated. I suspect they should be very similar. Okay, so let's go ahead. Let's do quantitative methods, right? We did ocular inspection. Let's do quantitative. Now, a verigram map is a very powerful methodology to explore spatial continuity. If you have enough data, do a verigram map. If you have sparse, sparse data, you won't be able to do a verigram map. So I think we can kind of get a verigram map here. And so let's go ahead. Let's do a verigram map. Now, I didn't have verigram map included in my package when I built this workflow. So I, in fact, just put code. I coded up a verigram map method as a function Verigram map v. So this is the function right here. I just included it. Okay, so now we have a verigram map making function and we can run it. What we have here for parameters are the first one is going to be the data frame, the x and y feature. That makes sense. We got to know where the data is. The normal score transform of the porosity, which is the spatial feature we want to work with, trimming limits in case we want to do some type of filtering, removal of outliers. We could, um, we'll say that these values, um, we want to omit them from the calculation. We don't have that situation. Set it as negative 999, positive 999. We'll just remove it. The number of lags. Now we're going to make a mesh of cells and the cells will be regularly sized. So in the X direction and the Y direction, they must have the same cell size or extent. And we're gonna say from a central location of zero, zero offset, how many cells do I want to go in each direction? We'll say 11. Okay, let's, we'll just say 11. And then we'll say the DX lag, which is the size of the cells in the X direction and the Y direction. And so now what's happening is we're going 550 meters over from a center node. Now the center node is going to be zero, zero. The cells are 50 meters across. So we'll go across to 25 meters that will get us to the edge of the cell. And now we're going to go 11 times 50, 550 more meters to the edge of our mesh. 
Okay, now if you look here where I I'm going to plot it, I'm going to say go negative 575 to positive 575. And now that makes sense because it got zero at the center, 25 meters plus 550, zero at the center, 25 meters plus 550 the other way. That is a mesh that's going to go from negative 575 to positive 575 in both the X and Y directions. And we'll take a look at that right now. So this program is going to calculate that. The Veragram map is going to be the Veragram values over that two-dimensional mesh that we're going to visualize. As a, and then number of pairs, which is going to be the number of data used for each one of those cells, which is good to look at to make sure we don't have something unreliable results. Okay, so let's go ahead and run that. That should run pretty quickly. And there it is. Now, don't be too worried about these diamond shapes and so forth. What is that? Well, we had a 11 plus 1 plus 11. So we have a 23 by 23 mesh of values that generated this map. And so you can imagine for the contouring program that we're using here, that's not a dense data set. 23 by 23 values with a zero in the middle. And so that causes these kind of shapes because it's really using an interpolation method here at the middle. That should be zero because at that point we have a zero offset. The varigram at zero H lag equals zero is equal to zero. There is no difference between data and themselves. If we move in this direction, in the 45 degree direction, or the 045 azimuth, look what happens. The varigram rises, rises, rises. Now let's pay attention to the color bar. This orangey color is the sill because we standardized to have a sill equal to one. So let's look for that orangey color. So we're going, going, going right around here. We're probably getting to that color. We've reached the sill. And then we start to go lower again. So we've got some cyclicity a little bit in the four, zero, four, five. Now let's go in this direction, the one, three, five azimuth. We're rising, rising, rising. Look up right here, we hit the sill. That's definitely crossing the sill. We're getting to that orangey color. And so at a very short distance, that's the minor direction. This major direction. The range, well, I could put my fingers up there and try to make some estimates. I don't know, maybe 250, 300 meters in the major direction, maybe 100 or so, or a little bit more in the minor direction. I'm probably underestimating. We'll check. But now we have a sense of directionality from a Veragram map and a general estimate of range. I could have been much more careful for sure. Okay, so now let's calculate experimental Veragrams. Now, what we're going to do, the best way to do this for explore, exploration of directionality, don't just calculate one experimental Veragram, calculate directional Veragrams over a set of azimuths. And guess what? We're working in Python. Everything can work with arrays. So we'll declare an ASI matrix or array with 0, 22.5, 45. You see what I'm doing? 0, azimuth, 22.5, 45 azimuth, 67.5, 90. You see, we're just going around all the way to 50, 157.5. Now, I don't go to 180 because 180 is going to be the same as zero again, right? The varigram in zero azimuth is the same as the varigram in 180, north and south. It's symmetric, right? And then what we'll do is we'll just loop over all of those directions. Now, we can set the lag distance, the lag tolerance. I said the lag distance is 100 meters. Now, if we look back at the data, that's not a bad lag distance. The data, that's probably about 100 meters apart, maybe 80 meters apart. This, there's a lot of data at that distance separation. So 100 for lag distance, unit lag distance makes sense. We'll calculate the varigram in each one of those directions for a lag of 100, 200, 300, 400. It's easy. Okay. Now, what we, can, what we also do is we have to pick a lag tolerance. Now, the convention is typically to pick one half the lag distance so we don't have overlap between the bins and we don't have any gaps between the bins and i've explained the search parameters for varigrams in a previous lecture now by setting it as 100 we're in fact overlapping the bins we're smoothing the outcome and that's fine that's fine we'll do number of lags of seven because we want to calculate out to about 700 meters and that makes sense because our data set is 
1,000 meters by 1,000 meters. And so you could say in the 45 degree direction, half the data set extent would be about 700 meters. You know, just basic trig. The direction distance across here is gonna be about 1.4 or 1,400 meters. So about one half the extent of the data set, the maximum would be 700 meters. We should have pretty good reliable variograms up to that distance. Okay, so let's go ahead and run that calculation. We're gonna loop over all of those directions and plot them up. Okay, now I forgot to run that box again. I've done that before, I get too excited. Okay, so now it's running and here's the result. Azimuths, zero, zero, zero. Azimuth, 22.5. Azimuth, 45. Azimuth, 67.5. Azimuth, 90. 112.5, 135, and so forth. Now, if you look really carefully, what you'll see is the range of about 250 or so in the 135 direction. That's more than I expected. But then if you look in the 45 degree, degree direction, now we're talking about a range of about 400, 450 in that direction. We're definitely seeing better spatial continuity in the 045, confirming what we saw in our ocular inspection approach. Now I wanna, I can't help myself. Let's try one more thing out before we finish up with this. We were overlapping the bins and potentially smoothing this result a little bit too much. Let's go back to our convention of a lag tolerance equal to one half the lag distance. We'll go ahead and run that block. We've set the parameters and let's rerun that. Let's take a look. Okay, what are we seeing now? About the same experimental variogram in the major direction, about 400, 450 probably for the range. What's happened in our minor direction of 135? Well, you know, that seems like it may have shortened up a little bit, about, nah, probably about the same. So we really haven't changed things a bit. If you do look carefully, you will see a little bit more noise in the result. Remember, we're basically always balancing the degree of specificity Given the amount of data we have to explore the spatial continuity, the amount of detail we can actually see, and then the amount of smoothing by using larger bins, larger tolerances, and so forth. Okay, so I'm going to finish up right there. We, show, we demonstrated the detection of spatial continuity directionality for spatial data analytics with a varigram using ocular inspection, varigram maps, and iteration over multiple directions, calculating directional semi-varigrams or varigrams. All right, I hope that was helpful for you. I'm Michael Perch. I'm an associate professor at the University of Texas at Austin. I record all of my lectures and put them on YouTube to support working professionals, my students, and everybody. So I hope this was helpful to you. Everybody, take care.